All right, everyone. Uh, welcome to the next podcast with uh, our guest today, Vincent, Vicente Diaz. Welcome. Thanks a lot for having me today. No worries. It's good to have you here. Um, how's the weather over there in uh, beautiful Spain? Well, um, surprisingly today is bad. <laughs> it's very oh. rainy. <laughs> okay. It's one of those odd days. It's uh, surprisingly sunny out here, thankfully. Oh, but nice. uh, let, let's get into it. I mean, um, decided to tell me, tell me about yourself. Um, what keeps you up at night? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, so many things, right? <laughs> so about myself, uh, I've been working in, in the security industry for a while. I think at this point, this should be like, let me count quickly, uh, like more than 15 years. And uh, basically when I was out of university, uh, I was doing computer science and yeah, security was not such a big deal at the time. We didn't have so many things to, you know, so many materials. So it was mostly, I don't know, uh, talking to people, going to these hack labs in the city, discovering interesting stuff. And I don't know, I, I got hooked by the idea of everything that was possible to do. And, you know, this was quite eye-opening and the rest was fun. Yes, you know, trying things, new techniques, understanding what was behind. Uh, at some point, you understand that you can make a, a living out of this. And this is how I jump into the security industry. And well, since then, everything was fascinating. Um, you know, starting from most basic stuff uh, at the time, jumping into the era of uh, banking trojans and then jumping into APT attacks. So yeah, it was, um, it was quite all right. But at the same time, I feel like we are still in the very beginning. And <laughs> there is no foresight of this slowing down in the next future. No, absolutely. I think um, it's it's definitely an evolving space, isn't it? The whole security world, um, everything to do with how threat, threats are happening and just all of that. How do you secure your environment? How do you find these threats? I think it's, I think it's a, pr a crazy kind of um, place to be in as well. It's something I've been quite, quite interested in, um, to be honest. Uh, I started studying computer computer science uh, when when i was back in technical college and the whole security world was very uh, at that time sort of in the shadows there, there wasn't too much information about it so to to get that information you need to be speaking to people on you know various different channels the underground channels and try to sort of understand okay where do you start in this kind of thing Yes, yeah, so I think what 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 you what we were getting into was uh, where and how you started getting into this kind of intel and it's and these kind of investigations. Right. Um, so I, I was coming from an easier time where we were not working in all these super sophisticated attacks. It was most like uh, banking trojans with the configurations uh, that were like providing a lot of information. Uh, using CNCs that were open, uh, nothing was encrypted, so it was easy to understand what was going on. And then suddenly, Stuxnet happened, which uh, I was not involved in the investigation or anything. I was just watching the news and, of course, interested, but nothing I was uh, really involved. Um, but at the time is when I joined the Global Research and Analysis Team in Kaspersky. And basically, this, were, this group of people who were investigating these kind of attacks. Um, which later was known as APTs. And now they are not called APTs anymore, but uh, well, basically were all these big attacks uh, targeting governments, targeting uh, persons of interest, targeting big companies, uh, very sophisticated. And uh, we were starting to do some hunting and suddenly these attacks were there for five years. Nobody noticed until then. So all of this for me was like a new world understanding that this was happening, uh, which uh, at the time was not widely known like it is at the moment. So um, for me, this is like, let's say, the tipping point in my career where I started joining 
all these uh, kind of investigations. And well, uh, when you're investigating these attacks, you get a lot of information. Uh, there are many, many groups. It's difficult to understand who is who, uh, who is doing what, how they are related or not, etc. And here is where I got interested in what now is called threat intel. Um, well, this is again one of these big words that can be used in many different ways, but basically was trying to make sense uh, on these kind of attacks. And, and yeah, this is how I got interested in into this world and started working like more dedicated to all these kind of investigations and, and threat intel. Oh, amazing. Yeah, I think uh, threat intel is definitely one of these words that uh, you're right, they're used in so many different applications. So, I mean, for example, um, in, in daily life on, in, in my world here, um, I'm constantly catering solutions to CSO teams and CDI teams and, uh, you know, cybersecurity teams, fusion centers, threat detection centers. And I think uh, this word has evolved so much that it's even contextual in, in every single one of these avenues as well, you know? So what, what does threat intel mean to you right now and where you are right now? Well, uh, in my current position uh, in BiosTotal, uh, I'm most interested in uh, helping our customers and, and to develop our platform so it is useful for everyone. Uh, but if you go to the, to the, let's say, to the roots of what threat intel means, well, if you think about that, intelligence by itself, uh, you know, traditional intelligence is something really old and we are inventing nothing new here. It's trying to make sense of things and there is like a well-known circle of intelligence, how you should proceed in every stage, etc. Um, I think that at the end of the day is having the capability to make the right decisions based on, on the threats that are around us. And uh, it, this is not so easy to understand how to make it happen because <clears throat> uh, the whole security industry, the problem it had for many years is uh, how you can justify the investment and mm -hmm. how you can show that, hey, uh, these two million that we put here, they are paying off, right? So um, again, uh, this threat intelligence is even a bit more complicated, especially for non-technical people, because here we have uh, many different factors. From one side are technical threats themselves, from another are the, uh, the strategy that you are developing for uh, your company in terms of security, but also there are the goals that the company is having, and this could be economic goals, this could be growth goals, etc. And this should be taken into account too, because the problem is that there are no resources for everything, unfortunately. And sometimes even if you have, uh, it's difficult to understand what will hit you and how and how this will affect the whole business, right? So in my personal opinion, and this is my vision of uh, Threat Intel, uh, the goal should be shared with the business unit. So the security strategy is making sure that the business is kept alive and, and you know, that nothing fatal happens. So you, you need to stop making business, which at the end of the day is what companies want to do. Uh, so well, all of this is kind of, you know, very high level, uh, a speech like a, how it should work at the end of the day in the bigger picture of things. But I, I think that in a more practical position, I think that it's important to have a threat intel team that really understands uh, what is inside the company and really understands what is needed. And let me put an example. These days we are buying things like, I don't know, fits. And sometimes they are massive. Uh, but sometimes we don't really understand why we are doing that. We are just uh, accumulating these collections of IOCs without any context. Like, hey, uh, is this still alive? Is this still a threat? Uh, who is saying that this is malicious and why? And how this is affecting my business at all? Because uh, it could be, I don't know. I've seen like these fits with millions of IPs and these are from some botnet and these IPs are from particular users who got infected at some point. What are you going to do with that? Um, 
and and you know uh there are limits to computation uh, like try to put this big fit into some of your uh security stack uh, uh hardware or software and you will find out that they cannot digest this so that's why uh, threat intel is not simply going to the market and saying hey i need threat intel because intelligence itself is something you cannot buy that's why i'm saying you need the team to understand hey what you want to do with this and what we need to make it happen and then select what is needed in the in the market and i think that one of the most important things is this context to read the information and to understand okay what is this exactly and what we do now because it's not only again having these millions of alerts per day it's understanding which ones are relevant and where you need to put your resources and, and here in my opinion context is uh, what is maybe making the difference between uh, a team who knows how to react to something or a team that is simply collecting, you know, trillions of <laughs> indicators mm -hmm. and, and doing nothing about this. So it's all about uh, more sophisticated playbooks as well as ensuring that you're using that that information the right way, isn't it? Um, right. So this this brings me about to just the fact that you work at Virus Total. I think that that's pretty amazing. Uh, so for the for the inundated, what is virus total and, and what do you guys do? And what do you do there? All right. So virus total is a crowdsourced threat intel platform. And let me try to explain these words. <laughs> crowdsource is because our telemetry, all the data we collect is from users around the world who are like submitting to virus total to check if something is malicious or not. Like, hey, I found this file, I don't know. And, and I don't know what is that, is this malicious? So this will be checked against like 70 plus antiviruses. And you, will you will have an idea if I don't know, 69 of them are saying it's malicious, probably it is. Uh, so from here, we have a very, very transversal visibility. And all the data we get uh, from all these millions of users every day we get all these malicious files and uh, we uh, put them through a pipeline going through every security uh, every security tool uh, this way we can extract absolutely every single detail from the files and we can relate them uh, for instance you find this file and when you go to Total, you see all the data inside when it was submitted uh, what is the metadata why this is suspicious, uh, if the community is saying something about this, and then how this is related to other files. And this file, by the way, appear in this publication. This file is related to this one. This file is similar to this one. This is the infrastructure. So let's say you're a security analyst. Here you have all the information. You can simply go and, and understand what is that? What is this threat? It's probably in this context. And once again, the fact that we have all this huge community, all these millions of users uh, sharing with us, with this community, is like building this collective knowledge that everybody can 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 use. Uh, my role there is as a security analyst uh, in my previous life is trying to help our customers, trying to help our uh, product to develop uh, how a security analyst could benefit from it and understand what are like the best ways to to keep evolving uh, and to improve our product and also i do a lot of um, sharing with the community training uh, showing some of our research and well basically trying to share with the community what we see and at the same time well uh, help them to understand how we can do better threat hunting no, that's really cool. I mean, <clears throat> it's uh, virus total is something I probably use every single day in 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 all of our discussions, in our demos. It's um, it's it's definitely part of our tool stack as well uh, when it comes to showing off how Multego works. So, tell me about some of your investigations at uh, at virus total, and have you come across anything crazy? <laughs> well, so uh, you know, virus total is like. Uh is so huge and <laughs> there are so so many things it's very interesting how we still can find stuff that nobody noticed for years uh, i just remember recently some publications from uh, some security researchers which they did a great job 
finding some tools related to, <clears throat> excuse me, to equation. Uh, if you remember the APT in 2015, infecting the firmware, et cetera, et cetera. So they, they found this like recently and this is surprising. Like, well, still there are so, so many hidden treasures, let's say uh, in there, there, there is so much data. So inside of Aristotle, in our team, uh, we try not to concentrate in, in anything very specific unless, well, this is right in our faces and, and we are like, oh my God, what is this? We try to, to do more like this uh, analysis, um, big picture, uh, you know, threat landscape, etc. Because um, this is very different to what I was doing before. So before we were going into the detail, we were analyzing every single file uh, deeply and understanding what is this. But I think in Barry uh look, uh, we have all the security industry. We have so many amazing research teams and they are doing a great job. They are finding all their stuff by themselves. Um, I think we have a different position here where we can see the whole database. And uh, this is, I think, is, is more relevant for us to show how it looks like in, in big terms that going into anything very deep, again, unless we see this something uh, very clearly and then we want to share with the community. So for the last year, we were doing some research on ransomware attacks, like how it looks like, how it is evolving. And this year we are preparing a report. Uh, well, we are preparing several ones actually, but one that will be published um, by the end of March. And we are finding what are the trends in, in in terms of malware, how it is evolving. And I can tell you, even uh, checking this, like, once again, high vision uh, data, we find many interesting stuff. Uh, for instance, uh, I can anticipate something that we are going to publish is like, we were checking like the top CVEs vulnerabilities used by attackers by malware during 2020 and 2021. And from these top CVEs vulnerabilities, uh, we were uh, like checking, okay, how long it takes for attackers to deploy the exploits once the vulnerability is made public. And in 2021, uh, once again, for this subset of the most uh, popular ones, the average time was they were in the same day, uh, which is crazy. Uh, in some cases, obviously there are zero days, so they are before, which we count like negative for the average. But for the most popular ones, we're like right away immediately, uh, which is telling us about this supply of, uh, let's say, exploits. Maybe because there are so many proof of concepts these days available. Um, the, actually, the last year, I, f I think it was a new high record of 51 or 53 zero days found in the wild. So wow. this kind of a stuff is, is like, well, you know, when you take a look, but the big picture is like, wow, surprising. Or how attackers are uh, dropping the use of uh, docx files in favor of uh, Excel, Excel SX uh, files. And I think there is not a really technical reason other than maybe social engineering, like everybody got used a doc file, maybe it's malicious, but Excel, I didn't know there could be a macro in there, right? and this kind of stuff. Uh, a lot of implementation of X was also using things like PowerShell mm -hmm. and all these skipping language. So uh, uh, and there, are, like, some, uh, there is so much interesting data, but again, this is our point of view, which is not the full kill chain. And uh, I would love to you know, discuss also all these points with um, other uh, colleagues on the security community who have like other disabilities. So I think, you know, we want to do our part, share what is our visibility. It doesn't mean this is the ultimate truth. This is how we see, you know, it's just pure data and we put it there and, you know, it's like trying to make this puzzle all together. No, that's amazing. I think um, in reading, in reading books, like uh, for example, Sandworm, and you can see how Iraq is just propagated through all these different networks. I think that that same concept is still alive today. It's just the fact that some things are known and some things are not known. And a, there's so much still being discovered out there. I, I think it's pretty crazy, to be very honest with you. It's, it's, very interesting, um, it's a very interesting world that we live in right now. I mean, with so many APT groups and threat actors also literally active every single day, exploiting whatever they can with the with with any CVEs that are coming out. Maybe they have um, 
published CVs that they're working on. But you're right, there's 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 so many POCs available as well, and there's just so many resources for POCs. It's um, it's pretty wild. So like, are there any interesting threat actor groups out there that are not too well known at the moment, or that are probably um, going to be eventually a threatening group? Here are my thoughts about this, and once again, maybe <laughs> you disagree with them, but I see like there were like different stages in all this APT world, and the first one were like these actors that were, I don't know, since Moonlight Maze in 97, 98, and we, we saw like the the peak of them, like with stacks, net attacks, uh, everything was here. Well, you know, the, the groups who understand from the very beginning and they put resources and they started developing their own stuff. And then I feel like everything blew out in 2015 after uncovering things like equation. I feel like some of these major groups started rethinking their strategies like, hey, not cool. <laughs> we put a lot of money into this and now all this data is being published. And actually it was giving some fuel for attackers too, right? Uh, WannaCry was weaponized with Eternal Blue and Double Pulsar, which was leaked uh, right before by the Shadow Brokers. Or even this exploit. Um, I think Double Pulsar actually was being used by APT3. Uh, it is suspected that attackers apt3 was in the same uh victim than equation and by rebuilding some uh some network traffic they were able to to build exploit well anyways so this is like the first wave let's say these giant attackers then there is a second wave where everybody wanted this and there were many companies offering these services and hey uh, if you want here you have like uh, things like hacking team uh things by uh well uh, we we now see things like nso and etc and this is a giant market because everybody's interested <clears throat> in having these capabilities and then i will say there's a third group who basically built with what they could grab and as you said before there are many things available for anyone to to build like their own let's call it apt but Basically, there are all these great pentesting tools, um, things like Metasploit, like Cobalt Strike, and uh, things like this, uh, which are, um, well, uh, th these are providing you everything almost that you need, right? Once that you are in one of the big teams. And as you said before, too, there are all these publicly available POCs for exploits, etc. So everybody can build what they want. Now, we are in this world where the tracking of APT groups is extremely complicated because at the beginning, everybody had like the signature malware and now it's not the case. Everybody's using generic tools. Uh, there are many crime work groups who are like working hard um, on their targets with this ransomware business. They were able to, to make millions and, and they are hiring people and they are growing. And it's very difficult to understand who is who. I, I feel like all these TTPs, eventually, you will get the full enterprise metrics, if you know what I'm saying, right? Because we are like, okay, who is APT28? And, and we start tracking them, I don't know, in 2012. And we are adding, like, they are doing this, they are doing that. And we are now 10 years later. There are so many campaigns from these guys. And actually, there was some internal regrouping, which is suspected. And they are splitting different teams. They are using new and old tools. So who are they in reality? And the ultimate question is, do the final victim really care about that? Or they only care of being infected or not, right? My feeling is that all these groups who suddenly disappear, this is what worries me. Uh, like, why we never saw, I, I don't know, a question anymore, right? Since 2015, where are they hiding? Did they drop the business, let's say, or we are simply not able to see them? Uh, are they sitting, I don't know, in hardware equipment? Are they sitting in <laughs> some internet joints? And this is what worries me. Like. When we are not able to track them and monitor anymore, uh, let's take into account that all these groups 
well, they were maybe caught off guard at the time, but now they perfectly understand how we work, what tools we use, and how we do similarity, how we do Yara, how we do retro hands and things like that. So, you know, they can, once that you understand all this, they can uh, find methods to, to be invisible, let's say. And I feel like we are around this time. So maybe in the next months, years, um, we will find a way to uncover all of this. And then we will have some other major revelations of <laughs> what is happening there. Um, mm -hmm. But this is absolutely founded on nothing. It's just my personal opinion. And let's see. So, you know, I'm probably too romantic. I'm thinking like, yes, we will discover something huge <laughs> that we are not seeing at the moment. But yeah. again, I, unfortunately, I don't have uh, any details to say, yes, this is happening. No, I think it's, um, I think it's a really interesting uh, part, of, part of the sphere as well. I mean, uh, yes, we have things like Metasploit that help you write malicious code, upload it to a file, you know, embed it into a file and you can transmit it via email. But I think um, <clears throat> what's even more interesting is the the final stages of any breach so the escape and evasion like how do these guys actually stay hidden for so long how are they invisible for so long and what what is it really going to take to um to uncover these guys it's um i think that's i think that's amazing yeah uh, traditionally yeah just to say a, a couple of words more on this you know rookies were the ultimate invisible thing for us but the ones that they start sitting below ring zero and they are like in, in dream minus one minus two minus three which is a uh, hypervisor which is uh, the firmware which is even the hardware how you can uncover this and the process of reaching let's say even the firmware is so painfully slow and difficult and uh, it cannot be applied on a massive scale. So you cannot simply say, hey, let's scan all the firmwares for the hard disk in our organization. It's impossible. Mm -hmm. um, so even if you can, you know, dedicate crazy resources and, and understand how it works, there is not much you can do about this. So yeah, this is a bit depressing, right? But I guess we still need to improve our monitoring for some of the devices we use every day. Yeah. I mean, how about you? Have you um, in your activities being targeted as well? Well, <laughs> this is like <laughs> something that I think happened to all of us. So we jump into this world without knowing what was happening. And, or at least in my case, maybe some other colleagues knew at the time, <clears throat> maybe some of them know uh, at the moment, but uh, at the very beginning of all these APT discoveries, uh, what we knew about all of this, you know, and suddenly you were involved in something bigger and what you only wanted to protect the, <laughs> the users and you only wanted to, hey, this is some malware and this is attacking some companies, organizations, people, activists, hospitals, whatever, and you just wanted to protect them. And you were trying to understand what is going on here. And suddenly you uncover, well, this is malware, yes, but this is part of geopolitical game and, and something bigger, which what we know about this, we don't know anything. I mean, as security researchers and suddenly, you know, uh, if your company decides to go publish some details, uh, suddenly you are disrupting this operation. And well, again, what do you know about all of this now in the big games? Actually, when working at, at, at Kaspersky, Kaspersky was hacked and it was made public. So it's not only individuals, it was the whole company at the time. And also individually, we had many problems. Uh, yes, we were targeted repeatedly. Uh, sometimes we discover earlier, sometimes we discover later. And not only that, it's, it's not only being targeted by malware, it's also being targeted personally, like in real life, someone mm -hmm. approaching to you uh, or going into your uh, room in the hotel or uh, taking your computer or trying to recruit you for some secret services, etc. So 
all of this uh, came to us like something absolutely unexpected. Everybody reacted differently, but obviously everybody uh, cannot be indifferent to something Thank like you. this happening, yeah. right? Um, I don't know how it is right now. I think probably it is not the same, but at the time was pretty aggressive, uh, at least by some, let's say, pleasures in all of this. Um, probably this is still something that happens. Um, I don't know how regularly, but yeah, it's something that at the personal level, you don't understand how you end up in this position. Some people can take the pressure, some people cannot. Uh, basically, we were learning as it happened, and we were trying to develop some strategies to protect ourselves. The problem is that you don't have, in reality, any power against that. Uh, let's say they decide to go physical and put you in a room. What are you going to do? <laughs> You're going to do nothing, right? So basically, it was how to de-escalate the situation and how to uh, how to make it out of this and, and nothing to happen to you personally. But yeah, it was stressful for all of us. Mm -hmm. did, did this spiral out of like something that... Uh, I mean, not just with the whole Kaspersky thing, but given the fact that you, you guys may have been targeted, was there anything, any kind of really crazy investigation that you, you were following that, that has also caused something like this? Or is it just, thankfully, and I hope for yourself, for your sake, that it was just that one, that one event? No, it was not one event. Uh, that happened regularly. And during some investigations, yes, um, you can see like how suddenly some colleagues were denied uh, flying to some countries, like some kind of punishment. Uh, I think it was made public. I, I will not provide many details, but one of our team members, he went home and he found this note. Like, maybe you can relax and let it go, uh, referring to his investigations, which is like, okay, they are in my home. <laughs> so it's like, breaking absolutely everything uh people being chased in i don't know hotels people going in, into hotel rooms and and finding someone in their rooms uh, or someone coming into the rooms where they were inside we were yes uh around some investigations uh i tell you i think the craziest years were probably between 2014 and maybe 17 18 uh, the investigations we were doing at the time, uh, well, uh, there were many people, let's say, involved and not wanting this to, I guess, uh, to happen or to know what we knew. After that, uh, the whole thing was just, you know, what do these guys know? And, and it was like uh, trying to survey and, and, and trying to understand what we were having, uh, you know, in our investigations. And But I wouldn't say... It was just this once, uh, one time event like this happened just once because we were investigating this and then we were being, uh, you know, uh, we were being um, spooked. Uh, it was just something that happened during all these years where I guess uh, everybody was experiencing something that they never experienced before, like their operations being published and the details being made public and uh, all these kind of things. But with time, I guess the, the doctrines for all these groups change. Um, probably now they have uh, different engagement rules because, well, uh, it's it's everything very tricky. Uh, happily, it didn't escalate more because, you know, at the time you don't know how far they will go. You don't know if, I don't know, they will kidnap someone or even worse or uh, what will happen but yeah as far as i know in the security industry nothing worse happened to anyone um, i'm hoping but yeah not that i can remember yeah i mean that that's pretty intense as it is i mean to show up in someone's house and leave a note there that's uh, that that stuff can give some people nightmares i mean that that can be traumatic for some for some people you know uh, people react differently to these kind of situations as well. So I think it must have been quite uh, quite tough at that time. 
yeah it's the mental health also uh, mm. you have families you you want to feel safe uh, you're you think okay i'm working here why i am in this situation what did i do and yeah it's it's very tricky yep so let, let me um, let me pivot back to a, a point that we just that we spoke about a few minutes ago as well so we were talking about things like metasploit and uh, you know these different toolkits um what's something that's part of your toolkit that you use day in and day out well um you know uh, these days most of the stuff i use is inside of firestore and I, i'm not trying to sell anything <laughs> i'm just trying to say that uh it integrates many tools and everything is already there so it, it makes life easier the thing is that these days for doing this investigations this hunting and you need a really huge database um this is nothing uh well you can do <clears throat> you can do by yourself of course but it takes time it takes resources and here everything is already there so if you want to pivot from one thing to the other you just need to click and get all the results and this makes life it makes life so much easier so uh this is like again once the data is in there which is not always the case obviously for some investigations so i would say that other than everything you can find in, in this kind of tools um well you know ida and company is, is something that everybody needs to use uh, at some point just to understand how the malware the malware works inside and um, things like cyber chef for instance are super useful yes for you know uh, these tool books with uh, everything that you need to 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 check stuff and and everything but uh, i will say the most important tool that everybody needs at least to understand a little bit if you want to go into threat hunting is yara i think yara is the absolutely <laughs> fundamental tool and uh, not only yes because everything you can do which is great it's also you know somehow providing you some understanding uh what is inside of these files how malware works and what you need to pay attention to and uh, somehow is the tool that when you learn you learn more about malware you learn more about how it works and it's like pushing you to really uh, understand what is there and at the same time i think it's a phenomenal format for sharing intelligence you know if i'm sharing with you today hey brad here you have this ip you're like okay what is that <laughs> you need more information you need to understand uh, the context but if i share with you some yarn rule and you check the rule even if i don't say a word at least you have some ideas what i'm trying to do here what i'm looking for what i consider is relevant from this malware etc so i think uh every time that you are sharing some yara rules you are providing a lot of information a lot of context and this really helps to the community so i think it's an excellent format for sharing intelligence oh that's interesting definitely something um something something we've heard mentioned before as well so um we've, we've spoken about all the historical stuff and and, and, what, and what's going on interesting point about jara there as well do you have any passion projects that you're working on outside of this whole threat intel sphere well or maybe uh, inside the threat intel sphere <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah uh well it, you know the problem is first of all time uh it's everybody I, I, i'm not complaining more than anyone else that you know once you have like i don't know your job your family um uh, your mortgage <laughs> it's it's just, you know not much time left for anything else but i think it's incredibly important you know to put some time off the computer and and to do something different me myself uh, i find very interesting uh, educational projects and this is something at some point uh, i wish i will have more time to dedicate uh, maybe to find better ways to share knowledge to help other people understand and to provide like cool uh, resources for you know learning uh, this ever changing world and and rapid changing uh, discipline that is uh, threat intel that is security um i don't know i i also like to write i was thinking uh, some of my colleagues you know they 
some of them are, are writing some super interesting articles, sometimes even books. Uh, I, I don't think I have anything really interesting to say. <laughs> so, but at the same time, I, I feel, you know, this is something maybe I will give it a try at some point. I don't know about what. Uh, sometimes I found myself, I couldn't stop writing uh, my opinion on, on some stuff and maybe put it in medium or whatever, just because I thought it was interesting to share. Uh, so all of this I like, but yeah, not much time to really develop like something parallel. I don't know, like a sandwich shop or something like this. Uh, it's, it's something that, you know, uh, I don't do, but yeah, it would be cool to have like some, some time for this. Set up some hacky meals, eh? <laughs> yeah. But no, I mean, that's uh, the, the one point that was interesting for me is uh, when it comes to education, I think uh, education is, it's, it's reachable, but at the same time, reaching the correct resources is extremely difficult when it comes to very specific subjects. So but when you're looking at how do I get started with threat hunting, for example, uh, in 2000, I think I started in 2015, 2016 is when I started with bug bounty hunting and the places to get proper resources were literally YouTube videos. And I mean, there are some famous Twitter, Twitter handles that I could just tell you right now. I mean, you, we would follow them and there's so much information that you can now derive from their posts. And I think, um, sharing education is definitely one of these important topics. And I think, uh, yeah, what, what can I say? Where would you learn to even get started with threat intel hunting now or threat hunting right now? Right. Uh, I, I found myself in this situation many times, like me uh, suggesting, hey, um, maybe we can, I don't know, learn a little bit more about this, like, you know, mm -hmm. inside of our teams or whatever. And many times I was pointing like, yeah, why don't you research that and, and you and you show how, how we can improve on this or that. And I, I found it like a bit depressing, like, really? Like, uh, it's me who should like <laughs> try to find yeah. out and to figure out. But yeah. I understand like so many times we were like, uh, I wouldn't say pioneers. I don't want to sound like <laughs> too important because it's not like that. But it's true that there were not so many resources and you need somehow to figure out and actually uh, when you come to threat intelligence and being a good uh, analyst there are so many things uh, to consider and one of them that i found fascinating was uh, learning about all the psychological uh, biases that we have and all the decisions that we make based on some uh, preconceived answer that we are expecting to get or how we react, uh, our brain, how it works, you know, uh, under different circumstances and how we want to please other people, how we don't want to contradict what is said, how we have a very partial visibility and within this is the whole visibility. So there are so many constraints uh, at the time of making a good analysis that we need to take into consideration. And this is how our brain works. It's not like, hey, you are doing this wrong. It's just that we need to be conscious about this. And this is the very essence it's not like making a technical mistake in some analysis. Everything can be perfect, but then you can draw the wrong conclusions from here just because you don't understand <clears throat> how biased uh, you are sometimes just because we are built like this. So uh, for me, it was fascinating discovering everything out of the technical, let's say, environment, uh, even how to write some report. Uh, how to transmit mm -hmm. the right information, right? Yeah. Uh, I've seen people who are geniuses in terms of, I don't know, malware analysis, and then you cannot understand what they are talking about just because you are not <laughs> at the same technical level, right? So you mm -hmm. need someone to translate. And all this kind of stuff, I think, maybe it's not the typical, let's say, threat hunter path, but I think is at least at the same level of importance because at the end, you need to draw the right conclusions and being able to share with the rest of the world, not only with yourself. So uh, you need to teach yourself first uh, about all these biases and second, how to share this information in an effective way. Yeah, I think uh, r reporting is one of those uh, 
one of those aspects of, or well, even documentation, reporting and documentation is so underrated, but it's probably one of the most important things you can do in, in this, in this world, isn't it? I mean, not just in, not just in sales, but even, especially in, in IT, in, in, in cybersecurity, in, 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 in analysis. I remember um, when uh, w- one of the larger parts of offensive security, the certification was to actually produce a professional looking report. You know, right. <laughs> and yeah. I think, uh, it, as you said, sometimes taking taking your technical knowledge and passing it through a filter to make it relatable to a human is one of the biggest challenges. It is, and finding people who is able to do that is <laughs> so hard. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, I guess, special talents. Uh, they get special personalities as well. So. In, 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 given, given the situation, uh, the current situation, the current geopolitical situations that, that we are in, um, or let's say given the current status of, of everything that's happening right now in um, the early part of 2022, I think I'm going to have to re, uh, redo that. Uh, they're going to laugh a lot when, I, when they see that part of the recording. So, <laughs> <laughs> 2020. So... Let me start again. Um, given the the early part of 2022 that we are in, and what's happening in the world right now, uh, maybe we can talk really quickly about, let's say that uh, the, the top three tools or the top three methods that people can use to sort of protect themselves. Corporations that can that can um, use to protect themselves in this in this in light of what's going on with the current crisis. Have you any thoughts on that or any, any tips? Well, um, I'm not sure, uh, let's say, the current geopolitical state of things is really affecting uh, how to protect ourselves. But I would say that I always say the same. Uh, first, go through the basics. Like, are you... Um, updating the software, are you uninstalling whatever is not necessary, are you are you teaching people in your company how to protect against social engineering, things like Cyber that. Cyber awareness, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's uh, like the entry point for, I don't know, 70% of the attack or something mm-hmm. like that, it's, it's the first thing. Um, other than this, uh, as I recommended before, having this for companies like this team of threat analysts who are like, you know, aware of everything and able to understand how things are affecting your own business and what kind of decisions to make. Yes, uh, be aware, you will never be able to protect uh, against absolutely everything. It's simply, you know, by definition, it's impossible, but they need to know how to prioritize. And for me, it's especially relevant to monitor. Monitor like internally and monitor externally. Like, hey, what kind of threats we are seeing? How this is evolving? What campaigns are impacted now? What is the last vulnerability that is being exploited massively at this moment? What kind of systems they are being affected? So uh, you really need to be on top of things because these waves happen. And when these waves happen, if you are not ready, uh, you will be dragging. And the last thing I would say is absolutely <laughs> different. And I, I would say, you know, let's not worry that much about everything because it, it looks like, you know, all these conversations are always negative, full of threats, full of things to do, uh, full yeah. of, you know, running uh, and, and trying. It can to... be it can be very overwhelming, isn't it, for, for a lot of people. And I think it even affects their mental state. It does. I, I think it does uh, heavily. So... Try to take your time, uh, you know, to enjoy other things like art, uh, music, painting, sports, whatever. But really, I, I think it's super important for any analyst's mental state uh, to do these kind of things. Otherwise, you can be 24-7 just dragged by the events, by malware, by campaigns, by technologies, by techniques, by exploits, by zero days. It's uh, never ending. Mm-hmm. So take your time, you know, you, you need to be uh, able to do things and you need to keep your mental state. So please consider this like an important part of your job and, and use it to just do 
something absolutely different and and try to to enjoy a little bit other than you know this kind of depressive talks that i don't want to to be in this note you know i want to yeah. to have like some positive message and this is something interesting this is something that we are helping we need to feel bad about this uh, to feel good about this sorry <laughs> that we can do something to help other people to help protect against these threats and well not just you know being dragged by this uh amount of war technologies etc no i think uh i think that's some pretty sound advice um uh, apart from just monitoring your activities and uh or let's say monitoring threats and educating your your your, your people you got to enjoy the world a little bit haven't you yeah yeah, yeah. you got you got to sort of uh, give yourself that mental space to really be able to be effective in your day to day as well uh, and, and i think this is something um this is something a lot of us are now realizing the world moves fast and and, and that's just how it is uh but you're not going to be able to keep up with it if you don't have that mental space right that's right very cool uh so we're we're at the end of our uh, session for now uh, do you have anything interesting you'd like to to share with our listeners and our and our viewers well uh first of all thanking you for having me here it was a uh, real pleasure and at the same time you know uh, having everything uh, having said everything uh it was also the experience of my life and it's still the experience of my life uh, all that is happening here we are living interesting times and this is something to keep in mind uh we are in this unique position where we can make the difference for good at the same time uh well we will have some stories to tell to <laughs> our grandchildren absolutely some crazy stories eh? right. <laughs> amazing Vicente thank you very much for joining us uh it was it was a pleasure having you here on uh, the pivot with Maltego and uh so for everyone else who's listening and who's been watching uh take some advice from Vicente go out go outside enjoy the world and uh give yourself some amazing mental space so you can be more productive in life as well right thank you very much Vicente and um we hope to see you again thanks a lot take All care right.